DNA doesn't lie, but people do. Hey everybody and welcome to Crime Over Cocktails. I'm Tiffany, your host, and today we're going to cover the case of John Schneeberger. Well, I'm keeping it simple tonight and we're going to stick with McUltra, so can't go wrong with McUltra. John Schneeberger was born in 1961. He was raised in northern Rhodesia, now Zambia, and he received his medical degree at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. In 1987, he moved to Canada. He moved to the small town of Kipling, and he practiced at the Kipling Medical Center. In 1991, he married Lisa Dillman, who had two children from a previous marriage, and the couple ended up having two daughters together during their marriage. In 1993, he acquired his Canadian citizenship, but he also still retained his other citizenship in Africa. He wanted to kind of be able to come and go all over the place. On October 31st of 1992, it was a normal day at the hospital when 23-year-old Candace came into Kipling Memorial Union Hospital. She was hoping to speak with her friend who worked there because she had just gotten in a really big fight with her boyfriend and she was very distraught. Her friend ended up being off that night. The intake nurse suggested that she should still stay and see a doctor. She seemed very distraught and she figured she could probably use some help calming down. Dr. Schneeberger was the on-call doctor that night, but he was actually her normal doctor. It's also the doctor that delivered her daughter, so she was very familiar with him. He told her he wanted to give her a sedative that would help her relax because... She was telling him that she was so mad she wanted to kill her boyfriend, Danny. She didn't really mean it, but she's just letting him know how mad she is. She expected him to give her some pills or something to take home. She could sleep it off, wake up the next morning, and maybe be a new her. But the doctor had another idea. Instead of giving her pills, he gave her a shot in her arm. Almost immediately, she went totally numb and couldn't control her muscles. She said in her interview with Forensic Files that she felt like jelly and she wasn't even able to make out any words. It was scary and that sounds actually like very frightening. She did also state that she wasn't exactly sure what happened after that, but she said the best way to describe what she was feeling was kind of like when you go to the dentist and they numb your tooth with Novocaine, and they're going to pull it. You can't really feel anything, but you can still feel the pressure, and you can feel the tooth moving back and forth. Even though when she came to in the hospital room, she was all by herself, and she was fully dressed, she just knew that she had been raped. She was smart. She knew there were bags that were in on the exam room. You know how they go and they got all these little drawers and stuff. Well, they had the bags in there. She took off her underwear and put it in the bag. They insisted that she should stay the night under observation because she was still so dizzy. She never mentioned the alleged rape to anyone while she was there. But the next day, she did confront him and she asked him, what did you give me? And he responded with, did it give you wild dreams? She said right then and there, she knew it was going to be one hell of a fight on her hands. He's already coming up with explanations. He already knew what to say. As soon as she was released, she went home to mom and dad. She wanted to tell them what happened. She wanted to see what they think she should do. Ed and Virginia had absolutely no doubt that she was telling the truth just by looking at her, her demeanor, her body language. You know, you know your kid, you know when there's something wrong. She decided she wanted to take her evidence to an outside lab, somewhere that's not in her town. She wasn't sure if her mind was playing tricks on her or if this really did happen. She needed answers and she didn't want to point the finger without the actual proof. She drove two hours to the rape clinic in Regina. Swear to God, that is the name of it. I fact-checked like three times. It is Regina. It was there that they were able to find semen in her underwear, on her jeans, and on the vaginal swab. She now had confirmation that something happened in that exam room. 
The last time she had had sex had been weeks before that. They also took a blood sample and that's how they found that she had Versed in her system. Versed is most commonly used in anesthesia because it makes you numb and it knocks you out. Remember a couple episodes ago, I had another prick who wanted to use this shit. Sound familiar? She knew, like, she had never knowingly ever taken this medication. It's not something you keep by the bedside. Now that she knows there was in fact semen present, she got a little nervous. She was scared to fight him. She knew he was a respected doctor in the community. She knew people weren't going to believe her, but she had her kryptonite. Once confronted, he willingly gave a blood sample in his left arm under video surveillance with the nurse present, and when the results came back, it wasn't a match. She was dumbfounded. How can it not be a match? How is this possible? What happened? She was not the one to lay down and let this go, though. No. She wanted to fight because she knew if he was doing stuff like this to her, it was going to happen to other people. And she didn't want other people to have to go through this. That next year, she would continue to fight, saying that something was amiss. When she got lawyers looking into it, they were kind of concerned about a few things. I mean, for one, she never mentioned the rape to anyone the whole time she was there. Also, there were a few nurses that were in that room afterwards, and they said not only was everything in order, but there was no sign of a struggle or that anything wrong had gone on inside that room. And then you got the DNA. Kind of needs to be a match. So Candace starts thinking that there's got to be some way that that sample had been compromised. Either somebody was covering up for him, maybe it's contamination, not really sure. In 1993, John willingly took another DNA test, again under video surveillance, also from the left arm, and the police are watching over while this is happening. The police are watching the needle penetrate his arm. Then those cops take the sample to the forensics unit at police headquarters and do the testing there. But again, it was not a match. Dr. Schneeberger, okay, I hate to admit it, but it's kind of fun to say. Dr. Schneeberger, try it. (laughs) He told the police that Versed can cause erotic hallucinations. And that may be why she's just so insistent that this rape occurred. Even though it didn't, it's probably very vivid in her mind because of the Versed. Right? Don't be getting any ideas out there, people, okay? That's fine and dandy and all, but hallucinations don't create semen. So... In 1994, they closed the case and the town turned on her. They had rumors going on that it was because she was secretly in love with him. And then some people thought it was for financial gain. You know, she was a single mom. She said, screw that. And she decided to hire a private investigator. She hired Larry O'Brien to help her clear her name. He broke into the doctor's car, and when he got in there, he saw there was a chapstick that was on the passenger seat. Now, they couldn't be for certain it was his, but that's kind of all they had. Because they also did find hair strands on the headrest, but they had no hair follicle, so they couldn't test them. She then paid for an independent lab test. The epithelial cells matched. These are the cells that are found on your skin, your blood vessels, urinary tract, and organs. Now that they know the truth, they had a new problem. They broke into the man's car. It's not exactly a legit way to do things. They needed to figure out how he was able to pass not one, but two DNA tests. She filed a civil dispute and brought charges against him with the medical society. Candace said in her interview that if looks could kill, she would have been dead. She had to sit right across from his wife, who just glared at her, pretty much like, bitch, you are ruining my life. And she said she can remember saying to herself, you're so stupid. You're stupid. He's going to do this either to you or your children. He willingly gave a third DNA sample. And this time, they did it in the forensic unit 
at the police station. Each step, they're just stepping it up a little bit. Nothing's really changing. The examiner said that she wanted to take the blood sample from his finger because not only is that standard, but they don't need to take much blood. They don't need to poke your arm. He politely declined and told her that he can't give blood from his finger because he has a disease and that would leave his hand bruised. And I mean, clearly he's a doctor, so he needs his hands. Since he was giving the blood voluntarily, they cannot make him do a damn thing against his will. She starts to pull the blood and nothing. So she changes out the tube, gets another one, nothing. Finally, she was able to get a very small amount, but she noticed that the blood itself, it didn't look fresh. It was dark. It just looked old to her. She was very confused by this, but you're literally taking it from his arm. So (laughs) it's got to make you think. When they tried to run the third sample, the blood sample was not efficient enough to actually get an accurate reading. So they pretty much told her, like, sorry. You know, he tried. We can't match it again. I don't know. Case goes cold until April 25th of 1997. Now, it's been five years since Candace was raped. And now all of a sudden, there were new allegations against the doctor. But this time, the victim was his own 15-year-old stepdaughter. She told her mother that he had been coming into her room at night and giving her injections. His wife would later find a box that he had hidden that contained condoms, needles, and Versed in their home office at the home. Well, obviously, home office in the home, yeah. He was then arrested and underwent another DNA test. But this time, they had a warrant for the blood, which means it ain't up to you no more, buddy. We're going to do what we do. In the video, when they started plucking him and everything, he looks absolutely defeated. They took his hair, they took saliva, and they took the blood from his finger. Surprise, surprise, all three matched. His trial started in November of 1999. His defense was that she had broken into his home and stole the condoms to plant the evidence. He told them how he was able to pass the last three samples. He surgically inserted a tube under his skin that was filled with blood from a previous male patient. That's why the blood always had to come from his left arm. When they went back and looked at the videos of him giving the blood, in one of the videos, for one split second, you can actually see the tube. He just always had everything positioned perfectly. His shirt or his jacket was always right above where they would insert the needle. But by the time the third test came, it had been five years. Five years he's been walking around with that tube in his arm. It was old. That's why she was so confused. But he said that he had no other way of protecting himself from her. So that's why he stole the blood from a patient. Because Candace was trying to ruin his life. It took 7 years and 24 days for him to be found guilty of sexual assault, administrating a noxious substance, and obstruction of justice. It's disgusting that he was sentenced to 6 years in prison. Six fucking years. I mean, he was stripped of his medical license. His wife divorced him and then also reported him to the Canadian immigration authorities. But that is just absolutely fucking disgusting. In 2003, after only four freaking years, he was released on parole. He was then deported back to South Africa to go live with his mommy. They also stripped him of his Canadian citizenship that was granted in 1993 due to having obtained his citizenship illegally. He lied to the Canadian citizenship judge claiming that he was not the subject of a police investigation. Since he was a permanent resident of South Africa, he was returned there in July of 2004. When he was back in Durban with his mom, he actually applied to the Health Professions Council of South Africa to work in medicine. This is three weeks after his arrival. The council was considering the former doctor's registration until he suddenly withdrew it in mid-October. 
Not sure what happened there, but thank God. Why would you get six years? That is a slap in the face to not only Candace, but to his stepdaughter. That's disgusting. It's just crazy to think how you could have all these failed DNA tests and she just knew. She just knew. I mean, obviously, once you had the sperm and all that, like you actually had something to go off of. But for a while, it seemed like she was kind of chasing a ghost. I'm glad she was able to redeem her name. And now the wife wishes that she would have believed Candy because it might have saved her own daughter. All right, you guys, that's it for tonight's episode. Make sure while you're listening, you're showing the show, you're showing the show some love. Make sure you're liking, following, and subscribing. If you have an apple, leave that five-star review. Check out the website at crimeovercocktails.com. If you have a story that you want to talk about, if there's a crime that you know of that you want to talk about, reach out and we'll talk. All right, you guys, we'll talk crime another time. Bye.